Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Sunstone Hotel Investors Second Quarter 2024 Earnings Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session, and instructions will be given at that time. I would like to remind everyone that this conference is being recorded today, August 7, 2024, at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. I will now turn the presentation over to Mr. Aaron Reyes, Chief Financial Officer. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Operator. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this call contains forward-looking statements that are subject to risks and uncertainties, including those described in our filings with the SEC, which could cause actual results to differ materially from those projected. We caution you to consider these factors in evaluating our forward-looking statements. We also note that the commentary on this call will contain non-GAAP financial information, including adjusted EBITDA RE, adjusted FFO, and property level adjusted EBITDA RE. We are providing this information as a supplement to information prepared in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Additional details on our quarterly results have been provided in our earnings release and supplemental, which are available in the investor relations section of our website. With us on the call today are Brian Gillia, Chief Executive Officer, Robert Springer, President and Chief Investment Officer, and Chris Ostapovich, Chief Operating Officer. Brian will start us off with some highlights from our second quarter, including commentary on operations and recent trends. Afterward, Robert will discuss our capital investment activity. And finally, I will provide a summary of our second quarter earnings results and share the details of our updated outlook for 2024. After our remarks, the team will be available to answer your questions. With that, I would like to turn the call over to Brian. Please go ahead. Thank you, Aaron, and good morning, everyone. Overall, it was a productive quarter at Sunstone as we executed on all aspects of our strategy, recycling capital and closing on the previously announced acquisition of the Hyatt Regency San Antonio Riverwalk, further investing in our portfolio, completing work on one value creating brand conversion and making further progress on the next, and returning capital to our shareholders through increased dividends and share repurchases. Our second quarter earnings were in line with expectations as stronger ancillary revenues and successful cost controls offset softer leisure room revenue growth. While the near-term outlook for industry revenue growth has moderated, we believe that many of the primary drivers of the lowered expectations are isolated or short-term in nature and that the Sunstone growth story remains intact. We continue to be optimistic about our earnings potential as we move into 2025, which is largely driven by the contribution of our recently completed and in-progress investment activity and less dependent on moving solely with market RevPAR trends. Later in the call, we will share some additional commentary on the various growth drivers we have across the portfolio, but before that, Let's review some of the additional details on our second quarter performance. During the quarter, we saw continued strength in group activity and further recovery in business transient demand. While the backdrop for leisure travel was more mixed, there has been some encouraging signs at our wine country resorts. These are the result of our work to redefine the cost model while providing a world-class luxury experience and our efforts to increase the group mix to drive incremental business at both resorts. Our convention hotels once again led the portfolio this quarter, driven by the continued benefit from our newly converted West End, Washington, D.C. downtown, which grew RevPAR by 33% and total RevPAR by 42%. The post-conversion performance of this new flagship property continues to exceed our expectations as it is attracting higher quality groups and appealing to a broader range of transient customers. 
the West in Washington, D.C., increased total transient room nights by 28% year over year and at an average daily rate that was 34% higher than what was achieved as a renaissance in 2019. Our convention portfolio also benefited from the addition of the Hyatt Regency San Antonio Riverwalk, which exceeded our underwriting in the initial months of our ownership and grew total RevPAR by 20% in the quarter as a result of robust group and local food and beverage contribution. The strong performance at these two hotels more than offset the challenge performance in the San Francisco and Orlando markets, which were expected to have tougher comps given their lighter convention calendars. In total, second quarter convention hotel repar was nearly 7% higher as compared to the second quarter of last year. As we look into the third quarter, we expect our convention hotels to once again lead in Rev Park growth with further outsized increases in Washington, D.C., combined with more favorable booking patterns in Orlando, San Francisco, and San Diego. Our group pace for the second half of the year is up 17%, and while it remains early, we are encouraged by our group booking activity for 2025 which is trending up high single digits. We continue to monitor trends in business travel and are encouraged by what we saw in the second quarter. The Marriott Boston Long Wharf exceeded our expectations, growing RevPAR by 8% from increases in both rate and occupancy. San Francisco also performed better, driven by higher midweek transient demand as the market benefits from growing commercial activity in the downtown area, driven not only by AI and other tech-related businesses, but also from increased bookings from legal and financial accounts. As has been widely discussed, leisure demand continued to moderate in the second quarter, although the trends varied across our markets. We have experienced some ongoing normalization in pricing, particularly in Key West, where rates grew to very robust levels following the pandemic. During the quarter, Ocean's Edge grew occupancy by nearly four points, but at a lower rate than the prior year. To be clear, pricing at our resorts remains very robust, with comparable ADR up nearly 45% in the second quarter relative to the same period in 2019. The demand environment on Maui has been softer than expected, with both rates and occupancy lighter than projected in the second quarter, resulting from more subdued vacation travel to the island. While we expect some of these softer trends in Waialea to extend into the third quarter, which is reflected in our updated outlook, Bookings for the festive period remain healthy and above last year. There are incremental efforts underway or soon to be underway by local tourism authorities and other stakeholders, including the brands, to spur incremental travel to the area, which we anticipate will help bolster demand in the coming months. The island of Maui and Waialea in particular is an unmatched and spectacular destination. We fully expect demand will rebound as we mark the first anniversary of the tragic fires last year, and the island welcomes visitors to enjoy and celebrate all that the island and Waialea have to offer. Looking forward, Waialea's group pace is up 18% next year, and we are currently renovating guest rooms in the lobby to provide an enhanced guest experience. In other parts of our portfolio, the second quarter provided some more encouraging data points. In wine country, the Four Seasons Resort Napa Valley grew total rev par by over 22% as our operator was able to more effectively leverage group business and drive out of room spend. The Four Seasons residences are also outperforming 2023, 
with revenue pace up 93%. At Montage Hedelsberg, we saw the benefit of productivity measures we have been implementing, which drove 470 basis points of margin expansion in the quarter. These two resorts remain a key focus area for us, and based on what we see today, we expect both properties to grow total revenue and earnings in 2024 relative to the prior year, which should continue into 2025 given the encouraging pace data we are seeing. Four Seasons has 2025 group room nights pacing up 11%, which will add additional out-of-room spend and help to compress transient rates. Our second quarter results were impacted by the remaining renovation work at the recently converted Marriott Long Beach downtown. As we noted on our last call, the project encountered some permitting delays that were out of our control and which lingered throughout the second quarter and into July. This extended our completion date and led to some incremental displacement. While this resulted in lower expectations for the current year, the finished product looks great and the hotel is well positioned to grow earnings from this point forward. Consistent with the success we have seen at our DC conversion, the Marriott Long Beach downtown is already gaining transient share with fourth quarter transient pace at 96% relative to its performance as a renaissance in the same period of 2019. Group pace for Q3 and Q4 are up over 100% to last year, and 2025 pace is trending strong with rate and occupancy growth. In Miami, the transformation of the Andaz Miami Beach remains on schedule to debut by the end of the year. We were recently on site, and it's exciting to see the reimagined property starting to come together. The first phases of the construction will begin to wrap up in early fall, and we are looking forward to the resort's earnings contribution that is now just a couple of quarters away. While our outlook for 2024 has moderated, it is being impacted by some short-term factors, and we remain encouraged about the growth potential we have embedded in our portfolio. The guidance that Aaron will discuss shortly assumes that RevPAR growth will be 300 basis points lower and adjusted EBITDA will be 5.5 million lower at the midpoint than our prior estimates. What is important to note here is that nearly half of the RevPAR decline and nearly all of the EBITDA decline is associated with the permitting delays in Long Beach and the slower to recover Maui market. This means that apart from these two hotels, the profitability outlook for the balance of the portfolio remains solid as our operators are able to drive incremental group and business transient demand while effectively managing costs. As we look forward, we continue to believe that our setup for 2025 is among the most attractive in the sector. Our group production was healthy during the second quarter and up 2% to 2023. Layering on top of this are markets with better citywide calendars, the Super Bowl in New Orleans, strong group pace in wine country, and growth at Andaz and Long Beach should all lead to an impressive 2025. In the meantime, we continue to thoughtfully execute on our three strategic objectives, recycling capital, investing in our portfolio, and returning capital to shareholders. And we expect the combined impact of these to drive incremental earnings and value over the next several years. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Robert to give some additional thoughts on our recent acquisition activity and renovation progress. Robert, please go ahead. Thanks, Brian. Early in the quarter, we closed on our previously announced acquisition of the Hyatt Regency San Antonio Riverwalk, and we are very pleased with the hotel's initial performance. The market is healthy, and we are already seeing the results of our asset management initiatives at the property. In fact, we now expect the first year yield on our net purchase price will be closer to 9%, which is incredibly attractive for an asset of this quality. This higher projection is 100 basis points ahead of our underwriting, and represents meaningful accretion 
on the recycling of capital from the disposition of Boston Park Plaza. We retain the remaining proceeds from the sale that we can use to create further shareholder value, either through additional hotel acquisitions or the repurchase of our stock. During the quarter, we also made additional progress on several other investments across the portfolio. As Brian noted already, the renovation is in full swing at the soon-to-debut Andaz Miami Beach. As the first phases of the construction are nearing completion, we are now also working with the hotel team to prepare for the opening. We are pleased with the 2025 group booking activity we have completed to date and will soon be opening up transient reservation channels for stays beginning in December. We continue to be pleased with the progress being made on what is a very comprehensive reimagining of the resort. While the recent softer demand environment in Wailea has been disappointing, we are using the opportunity to move more efficiently through the soft goods rooms renovation we have underway at the resort. As you can see from the property level data we make available, our upper upscale property achieves robust rates and competes very effectively with its nearby luxury peers, and so a refreshed room product will allow it to continue to do so. We will be performing the remaining work around peak periods and do not anticipate any meaningful disruption at the hotel. Elsewhere across the portfolio, we will be completing a few other projects, including a meeting space renovation at our JW Marriott New Orleans, which is underway now and will be completed in October in order to take advantage of robust group business during the fourth quarter. At Montage Healdsburg, we added a small event facility at the resort's showcase vineyard venue that will allow us to generate incremental sales while also driving staffing efficiencies and contributing to higher margins. While these are smaller projects, they will add to the earnings potential and value of our portfolio. As we have shared with you before, capital recycling is a primary component of our strategy. And while we are actively evaluating additional acquisition opportunities, we remain mindful of all capital allocation opportunities available to us and the relative returns offered from each at various points in time. We will be disciplined and balanced in our approach. With that, I'll turn it over to Aaron. Please go ahead. Thanks, Robert. Our earnings results for the second quarter came in generally in line with expectations, as higher ancillary revenue and contribution from certain corporate-level items offset lower rev car performance. Adjusted EBITDA RE for the second quarter was approximately $74 million, and adjusted FFO was $0.28 cents per diluted share. Our quarterly results reflect the impact of the extended completion of the renovation work at our hotel in Long Beach, which resulted in $3 million of estimated EBITDA displacement in the quarter, approximately $1.5 million higher than anticipated. Together with approximately $9.5 million of year-over-year -year decrease in earnings at the Confidant as it undergoes its transformation to Ondas Miami Beach, we now estimate that we will incur $15 million to $16 million of total earnings disruption this year. Now that the work is completed in Long Beach, and as we get closer to the debut of Ondas, we look forward to recouping all of this displacement, plus additional earnings at these hotels next year. Included in our earnings release this morning was our revised outlook for the year. As Brian noted earlier, we have lowered our full-year expectations for Rev Park growth and earnings. The change is primarily related to the extended timing of completion of the renovation in Long Beach and the softer leisure trends we have seen in Wailea, which together are impacting growth in full year rev par by over 200 basis points. Based on what we see today, we expect that our total portfolio full year rev par growth, which includes all hotels in the portfolio, will range from a decline of 25 basis points to an increase of 1.75% as compared to 2023. If we exclude the Confidant Miami Beach, rev par growth is projected to range from two and a quarter to four and a quarter percent. As a reference point for our updated guidance range, the full year 2023 rev par metric for the total portfolio, including the Hyatt Regency San Antonio Riverwalk prior to our ownership was $219 and for the total portfolio, excluding the Confidant Miami Beach, 
prior year rev par was $222. Including our revised outlook for the balance of the year, we now estimate the full year adjusted EBITDA will range from $242 million to $252 million, and our adjusted FFO per diluted share will range from $0.85 cents to $0.90. Cents. Well, there is not as much of a seasonal variation between the quarterly earnings in the second half of the year as there is in the first, historically, the third quarter has contributed more to full year earnings than the fourth. At the midpoint of our revised range, our EBITDA in the first half of the year would equate to 52% of our total projected full year earnings, and we currently expect that an additional 24% to 25% will be generated in the third quarter, with the remaining coming in Q4. Our balance sheet continues to be one of the strongest in the sector. As of the end of the quarter, we had over $230 million of total cash and cash equivalents, including our restricted cash. We retain full capacity on our credit facility, which together with cash on hand equates to nearly $730 million of total liquidity. We have one piece of secured debt coming due at the end of the year. We are finalizing our refinancing strategy for that loan now, and will provide an update as part of our next earnings call. Our conservatively levered balance sheet and significant liquidity position continue to provide flexibility and be a source of strength for the company. Now, shifting to our return of capital, our board of directors has authorized a base quarterly common dividend at our recently increased rate of $0.09 cents per share. In addition to the dividend, we have also repurchased approximately $7 million of shares since the start of the second quarter. We retain ample authorization and liquidity for additional share repurchase activities. Separate from the return of capital to our common shareholders, the board has also authorized the routine distributions for our series H and I preferred securities. And with that, we can now open the call to questions. So that we are able to speak with as many participants as possible, we ask that you please limit yourself to one question. Operator, please go ahead. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad to raise your hand and join the queue. And if you would like to withdraw that question, again, press star 1. Your first question comes from the line of Michael Belisario with Baird. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mike. Good morning. Um, Brian, kind of big picture question for you. Just Can you remind us, review your view of value, what, what the board's view is, um, how they think about it, the path to get to that number, <clears throat> and then maybe how you're thinking both about the things you can and cannot control uh, in order to help close that valuation gap. Thanks. Yeah, well, um, you know, we we look at value, and it's something that we spend a lot of time with the board at every board meeting on, and, and like any other, you know, hotel investor, we look at it from multiple multiple ways. We look at it on a on a cash flow basis. We look at it on a relative multiple. We look at a replacement cost, and so we use all those and we triangulate on on our view of value and um, the way that that plays into our capital allocation strategy is um, at times when we see that deficit uh, we can we can do things uh, such as what we did at, at Boston Park Plaza where we we monetized um, and then we could use those to, to get the, the private market values and, and then go and either reinvest that into new growth opportunities or into our into our stock. And, you know, if you look over the last couple of years, I think our approach has been very balanced in that. Uh, and that as we look forward, um, you know, we have we have a great portfolio. We have great hotels and great markets. We have great internal growth that we've been able to um, build up on over the last couple of years and are now at a point where we have, you know, a, a cadence of hotels coming off a of renovation and providing earnings like with D.C. and going to Long Beach and Ondas next year. We have ramping hotels, um, San Antonio, one where we deployed the capital 
uh, has has done really well for us and is a market that we're very excited about for, for several years to come. And and we're very happy with, as, as Robert said, almost the, you know, a nine yield on, on that investment, um, you know, in that first year. And then, and then, of course, is also what we have done consistently over the last couple of years is when the stock gets to a, a meaningful gap is that we've been able to repurchase shares. And that's something that we, uh, we did again, um, you know, in, in the quarter recently and um, have that balance sheet capacity and that flexibility to be able to, um, to you know, pull on any of these levers at any time, and they change depending on where our valuation and where that gap is. Your next question comes from the line of Dory Kefton with Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Good morning. Um, during your prepared remarks, you described some leisure pricing as, as normalizing, but are there any hotels in your portfolio where you're seeing uh, true price sensitivity at the margin? I'm, I'm sorry, Dory, the last, the end the of last it? part of that? Where you're seeing just, like, true price sensitivity at the margin. Um, you know, one, one market we've talked about um, – you know, Key West has been has been one where there has been more price sensitivity. Um, we have been able to, uh, you know, capture some more occupancy there, but that that's one where uh, where maybe it's a little bit more sensitive, and whether that's competing, you know, options for the traveler, whether it be cruises or or other or other items, um, plays into that a little bit more. Other markets, I, I don't think that we've we've seen that as much. Um, you know, one market where where not on the leisure side, but on the group side, we've we've rationalized our pricing has been in Napa, which has been very successful, where we're bringing in additional groups, and you'll see, you know, when you go through the supplementals, you'll see the rates are are lower, and that that's because we're we're adding occupancy. Uh, we're taking the group at a more rational rate, uh, which obviously fluctuates over the different demand periods. But then we're getting that ancillary spend, where at Montage it's you know seven eight hundred dollars, at Four Seasons it's nine hundred a thousand dollars a day per group room, and that is uh, between that and our um, productivity measures that we put in place. You're seeing um, the cash flow for both of those assets increase uh, dramatically. Your next question comes from the line of Dwayne Senninger with Evercore ISI. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks. Uh, appreciate it. Just on Maui, given the asset level uh, disclosure that you give us, you know the, the the market doesn't really look that off, or it's at least hard to tell in the in the disclosure that you've given. Um, can you talk specifically about um, how your assumptions have changed in the back half of the year, maybe? you know, 3Q versus 4Q, and if there's, you know, specific groups or seasonal periods that um, really impacted the forecast. Thanks Thanks for taking the question. Thank, thanks, Wayne. Good, um, good afternoon. So so with Maui, I mean, your, your point is exactly right. It, you know, when you look at the supplemental, and it's, it's down, but it's not down a lot. It's, you know, at the end of the day, this is a hotel that's going to run around 70% occupancy at a, you know, mid to high $600 rate. Um, it is it is a meaningful hotel in our portfolio, and we have a concentrated portfolio. And if you have a concentrated portfolio, you want to make sure that you you have good you know, you have great real estate, you have good market exposure, and you have the ability to create value, you know, both internally with those assets and externally. And and Maui is a is a asset that is is an exceptional piece of real estate. And you know, when you look at our position within the Wailea market, you know, it it is is one of the better luxury resort markets in the world. And we're, you know, we're the value proposition there. Uh, we have an outstanding 22 acres, multiple pools, some of the closest rooms to the water that you can have. Um, 
and we compete with, with some very high-end luxury product in that market. Uh, what we started seeing in the second quarter is, uh, which tends to be a heavier leisure quarter than, than group quarter, is that some of the leisure demand did, did you know, moderate a bit. Um, and as we got into then looking at our projections going forward, the third quarter, the group business really starts in like September is, and then runs through towards, you know, um, towards the festive season. So from a group standpoint, group demand is still very good and our group pace is very good. Um, it's just that that group kicks in in September and when we look at the the leisure and, and more of the summer traveler, whether it's a combination of still traveling abroad or, or you know, other you know, destinations, whether it be Mexico or, or Europe, is that there wasn't group to, to help insulate that, that weakness. Um, and so when we look at the guidance and, and the change to the guidance, it really is that impact in the third quarter. And, and while the the tourism authorities and, and multiple stakeholders are doing promotions and other things to to remind the, the traveler that uh, what a wonderful experience Maui is. Um, it still is a longer booking window by, and so even with that going in, our assumption is that that, that that's not going to kick in until maybe September and then into the fourth quarter. And September, we already have very good group base and not a lot of additional rooms to sell to take advantage of that. Um, and then probably the most important period of the year would be the festive period in December. Um, rate is down a couple percent for that, but occupancy is up, um, you know, over 10 percent right now. And so, you know, when we look at a hotel or a resort like Maui, you really look at total rev par, and when we look at occupancy going up um, that that much on a on a pace basis, um, that should bode well for the, the back end of the year. Your next question comes from the line of Schmidt's Rose with City. Please go ahead. Um, hi, thank you. I wanted to just ask you about, um, I guess, the, as the um, Andaz comes close to being back online and should be a pretty big contributor into next year, could you just talk about, I guess, how you're thinking about the mix of business there, group versus leisure, and um, just with that, is, I know you mentioned that it's on time. Is it, does it remain on the um, on budget relative to what you shared previously? Yeah, um, good afternoon, uh, So Andaz is... <laughs> is in, you know, full renovation right now. As, as, as we've told you before, the hotel was shut down um, to really expedite the, the renovation. Um, you know, the ultimate mix for that hotel is, is probably right around 25% group. Um, you know, Miami, Miami Beach is a very uh, high transient leisure market. Um, we did through the renovation add more suites to be able to accommodate groups, um, and we also we also you know have you know th there's also some non non food and beverage group business that the hotel can do too, um, and so our our plan is is to have renovation wrapping up uh, for the most part in in you know the fourth quarter. Uh, be looking to the reservation line isn't open quite yet, but looking to book uh, rooms in December, use December, which is a good demand period, but use December as, as you know, time to, to fine tune the operation. So come the beginning of next year when we, and I believe most of the investors are counting on um, the earnings from the hotel to really kick in as part of our 2025 growth, uh, to be in a great position for that, um, you know that that's also a higher leisure time period. So transient bookings, um, you know, can can fill the hotel at that point. Uh, we do have the sales team is is you know fully engaged right now, and they are booking business. That business is probably 
you know, you want to leave a little bit of time to get things to running right. So that business is, is probably looking to come in, you know, mid to late January into February. But that, you know, we are putting business on the books right now. Um, we are getting a great reception. The pools are coming into into shape now. The backyard is coming into shape, and you're starting to see, um, you know, the vision is becoming a little bit clearer, which is exciting for, for groups. Um, as far as, as timing, timing is, is still for the fourth quarter. And, um, you know, I, I would say that as far as the, um, the budget of it goes, our, our last update, um, we're, we're roughly around those numbers right now. Um, still a lot of moving pieces, but we feel very confident with, uh, with this thing uh, being completed and, and ready to go. And most importantly, uh, creating EBITDA going into next year. Your next question comes from the line of David Katz with Jeffries. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Can you talk a bit about Napa and you know how you what, what you're seeing up there, and if that is encompassed in the leisure trends that you cited earlier, and and you know just how you're doing with those two assets, please. Thank you. Sure. Um, good afternoon, David. So in the second quarter, starting with with montage. Um, and, and remember, these from a group side, these are always going to be a little bit lumpy because you're going to have buyouts, you're going to have other other bigger pieces of business that that kind of come and go. Um, Montage, uh, you know, group it had some buyouts. It had a buyout wedding last year. Group was down a little bit, but we actually we had good transient pickup for the the quarter. I think transient was up about 14 percent. Um, group was down a couple percent, and our total because that group was down, our total rep par was was down, you know, a point or so. Even with that, um, with taking, you know, with having, uh, you know, the group base in there, and also driving the ancillary revenues, um, and then also remember that the montage is a little farther along um, in our our productivity measures. The resort produced eight hundred thousand dollars more of EBITDA than it did the prior year, even with Red Par being down. So it's showing that uh, we were able to work with the operator, uh, get the efficiencies that we thought were were appropriate, uh, and then also maintaining the the service levels of a of a true luxury hotel. Um, looking forward for the rest of the year, group pace is uh, is very strong in Q3. Um, and uh, we're we're on track to to be right around the, the group number that we thought we would be. You know, call it thirteen or fourteen thousand um, room nights. Uh, when we look into next year, we're very excited about Montage because we are up three million dollars in in room revenue pace, about seventy percent. Um, and so, again. The cost model is there. We're starting to see some positives on the transient side and the group business and that ancillary spend, and most importantly, the total rev par is, is producing. Uh, for Four Seasons, uh, Four Seasons had a very good uh, group um, in Q2. Uh, we are implementing some of our productivity measures there, so they're not fully realized. Um, the Michelin Star Restaurant has uh, is is increasing its its um, had increased its number of nights, has increased its revenue, is doing very well and bringing a lot of notoriety and and people to the to the resort. Um, and our profits were up again year over year about half a million dollars at that asset. So again, doing very well as we look into next year. Uh, the group room nights pace is up about 11%. As I said earlier, rate is down a little bit, but that is that is by design to capture the um, the ancillary spend, which is almost $1,000 a night uh, per group room. Um, so again, um, you know, it's taking a little bit of its time, but as we saw this quarter, uh, both of these hotels are absolutely moving in the right direction and producing that, uh, you know, the cash flow that we were uh, we were counting on, and as we look into next year, both of them are lining up really well. Your next question comes from the line of Chris Darling with Green Street. Please go ahead. 
Uh, thanks. Good morning. Uh, Brian, can you talk through your expectations for total RevPAR growth this year relative to RevPAR and how that might have changed versus prior guidance? Um, and then, you know, as you mentioned uh, in your prepared remarks, um, out-of-room spend and cost reduction supporting results this quarter. Um, can you help me understand how each of those aspects plays into the, the updated full year outlook? Okay. Um, let, let me start. On total rep par, um, it's probably about 40 basis points um, higher versus versus where rooms are. Yeah, I think if you if you look at how we've done um, through the first part of the year, you know, um, total rev par growth exceeded rooms rev par growth um, in the second quarter. We saw that also in the first quarter. Um, I think the magnitude of the disparity uh, between rooms and total for this year, I think, will will moderate a bit to versus what we saw last year. But as Brian noted, I think you, you'll you'll expect that the the total rev par growth should outpace rooms by about 40 to 50 bits. And, and you'll be able to see some some of that in our um, in our supplemental and and remember too that a big piece of that will be the group side of things. And unlike last year, where our group pace was heavy in the first half of the year, this year it's the second half of the year. And so there will be you know from a quarter to quarter basis, there will be some some lumpy, lumpiness to that. Your next question comes from the line of Chris Waronka with Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Hey, uh, good morning, guys. Thanks for taking the question. Um, I, I was hoping we could talk a little bit about Orlando. And, you know, I know historically it's been a pretty good asset for you guys, and this year pretty familiar with, with all the uh, issues impacting the Orlando market. But, you know, for your asset there specifically, the Renaissance, do you think it's totally a market kind of specific issue or – you know, what, what's your outlook for that asset next year relative to the market? Is there is there anything you think you need to do? Is it still considered, you know, core on a longer-term basis? Thanks. Yeah, I, good morning, Chris. Uh, you know, longer term, you know, we do have a lot of land there. Um, and so, you know, there there could be some opportunity longer term to, um, to enhance the assets and enhance its um, – you know, it's, it's leisure offerings. It's, you know, like our other or our past Renaissance hotels, it does very well from the group side. Um, it doesn't do as well uh, on a index basis on the transient side. And so when you look at, you know, look at, look at what, what we've seen happen in D.C., um, you know, our transient index, Year to date is in the 130s. Prior to the repositioning, we were in the high 90s, and so you know the branding obviously makes a big impact. Um, you know, from a leisure standpoint, the location kind of in between both parks was you know next to SeaWorld, of course, but between the two major parks was was you know never a made it the primary leisure destination choice. Uh, with the new Orlando gate opening, or, sorry, the new Universal gate opening, um, much closer to the hotel, that should help going forward too. So, um, you know, I, I think what we can do is is we can look in, especially when the new gate opens and see where that, you know, if there's additional demand shifting to our area, um, we definitely have the space to enhance the leisure um, you know, the leisure amenities at the hotel. Uh, looking at the group side, the, the, the bread and butter of this hotel has always been group. Um, it's been our space and the abundance of space, uh, including the, the atrium area, which we use really well. And so that will always be appealing to groups because we can give them more space per, per guest or per guest room than um, some of the other uh, competitors can or give them control of the house when in maybe one of the larger – uh, resorts, they're going to be, you know, group one, two, or three in-house at any time. Your next question comes from the line of Flores Van Dykum with Compass Point. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks for taking my question. Uh, Brian, maybe if you could talk a little bit about the, the transaction markets and, and also about uh, potential uh, rather, if, if 
if you know because what we're hearing is that uh, larger larger hotels are harder to uh, transact in, in the current environment uh, would you consider uh, putting mortgage debt on one of your bigger assets like for example uh, the Hilton San Diego and using some of that capital to buy uh, either another hotel or or fund more share repurchases okay um, good afternoon for us. Uh, you know, from a from a capital standpoint, you know, I don't know if we would need to put a mortgage on a hotel. Uh, we have a fully undrawn five hundred million dollar line. We have cash on the balance sheet. Um, and we have a low levered balance sheet. So as far as access to capital, whether we wanted to acquire something, whether it be uh, an asset or stock, uh, I think we have all the flexibility and firepower that we need to do that. Um, you know, as far as the transaction market goes, uh, you know, when we sold Boston last year and started looking for acquisition targets, um, our expectation were things were going to improve this year. Uh, and while the CM part of it was that the CMBS market would improve and that would improve the, the pace of transactions, the CMBS market has definitely improved. It seems like it's improved in mainly facilitating refinancings more than a lot of um, uh, purchases. And and as rates come down and the, you know, the, the cost of that debt comes down, then maybe we see some more private buyers become more active. Um, but up until this point, it, it really, you know, I, I, I would say we're, we're disappointed with the pace because we thought that there would be better opportunities um, to deploy the remaining proceeds from Boston Park Plaza. Now, we did deploy a good portion of it in San Antonio, and we are very happy with that transaction. And I think if we could find another San Antonio right now, we probably would – would it, it would be more compelling. Um, that said, we're not seeing a lot of that. We're not – to your point, we're seeing some maybe some of the smaller assets. Um, and then when it comes to actually deploying, it's – it's the same thing that we, we always look at. It, it's what is, you know, is balancing uh, deploying those proceeds into an asset and what are the return expectations of that asset and then compare that to where are we trading, um, where is our stock, and is that a more compelling uh, opportunity. And I think over time we've shown that we go back and forth between those, you know, pretty often. Um, and appropriately, and we try to remain balanced. And, and that's something is, you know, we said we've, we've already had some share repurchase um, that we announced in the release this morning. And given the, you know, the far, the, the lower the stock price goes and the, the bigger the discrepancy between that and our view of value um, makes a, a acquisition that much more difficult because we're going to need to make up for that difference. And so all these things ebb and flow. Uh, the good news is, is you know, we have we have the we have the portfolio, we have the balance sheet, we have all the flexibility we need to be able to be to be very nimble and to be able to go back and forth and and make make the right capital allocation decision. And that concludes our question and answer session. I will now turn the conference over to Brian Julia for closing remarks. Thank you everyone for your time and your interest. And uh, we look forward to seeing many of you in the, the coming months and we'll look forward to uh, the grand opening of the, uh, the Andas in Miami Beach later this year. Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation, and you may now disconnect.